Yes, my name is Houston, and this is Media Mood Board, a show about hyper-specific entertainment lists. Happy New Year, everybody. I hope everyone's having a super cozy uh, last day of the 2023. Each week this December, I've been counting down my favorites from a bunch of different mediums, and uh, we're finishing off with my favorite movies of 2023. To make the parameters clear, these are movies that have been widely distributed in 2023. So, for instance, uh, I saw Inside the Yellow Cocoon Shell at New York Film Fest this year, which I really loved, but it's not getting wide distribution until January. So, that's a 2024 movie. <laughs> Bored yet? Well, let's talk about the movies. New Year's Eve is always a time to look back and reflect on the year and see the things that you appreciated. And for me, 2023 has been one of my favorite years in movies for maybe like the last five. As kind of the embers of Marvel and the the, the brush fires of of franchising that 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 created have begun to die down, we're starting to see the energy of uh, movies being created when we're two car lengths beyond a uh, worldwide lockdown we're starting to get like a a a blurry silhouette of the next wave of movies this summer barbenheimer happened and created a fervor around going to the movies and made it a an event in a way that i haven't seen since infinity war and the things that those movies represent and the type of goals that they have uh, are a clear kind of comparison point uh, to infinity war Prestige TV has been watered down by streaming services and have been decentralized. So there, it's not even as much fun to, to, to watch stuff on streaming as it used to be when everything was, was in a clump. As recently as a couple of years ago, it would not be uncommon for me to watch a movie and say, oh man, it would have been really cool to see this in a TV series so they could explore it more. I almost never say that now. I'm excited not just by the movies that came out this year, but the response to them it's just really exciting about based on what happened this year the types of things that will be funded we'll get distribution and we'll get promotion in the coming years so with that all out of the way we're going to get to the list the way i've structured this i'm going to do my top 20 movies i'm going to do one sentence on each and then when we get to the top five i'll say a little bit more number 20 spider-man Across the Spider-Verse. This painterly animated movie is littered with like colorful experimentation all over the place. It feels more obligatory than it does inspired, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the best of Marvel's output, period. Number 19, Asteroid City. This is like Wes Anderson's watchmaker style tackling the idea of control and authorship. There's a pan around a Western diorama in this, which is probably one of my favorite shots in his entire filmography. Number 18, Anatomy of a Fall. This is a courtroom drama that plays with perspective in a really cool way, and it's anchored by some incredible lead performances. Number 17, Godzilla Minus One. This is a sci-fi reboot with the heart of a historical drama and is probably one of the most human action movies that came out this year. Number 16, Showing Up. This is a tactile, quiet grad school drama that has the pacing of like a Portlandia sketch, but it's anchored by a simmering performance by Michelle Williams in a story about community and kind of people's priorities within them. Number 15, Bottoms. This is a singular comedy with a beautiful sense of self. Just incredible world building that indulges every unhinged idea that its creators have. Number 14, Priscilla. Priscilla is a beautiful miniature oil painting of an isolated star just like stuck in various (laughs) rooms. I really found Coppola's focused novella-like vision of this really, really inspiring. Number 13, The Boy and the Heron. The Boy and the Heron is a run-on sentence that ends in a question mark. It it feels meaningful in a way that you feel like you can't understand with just one watch. And the animation of it vibrates with like this immediacy that should be impossible to conjure 
because animation is such a meticulous production process. Number 12, Rotting in the Sun. Rotting in the Sun is like a very dark, very funny thriller that in a movie with a ton of great scenes in it has an ending scene which has stuck with me throughout the year. Number 11, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, part one. I will fight for Tom Cruise on his Charlie Chaplin journey through the Mission Impossible series. Here he's crafting another movie to remind us what summer blockbusters are meant to feel like. If you have not seen these movies in theaters, do yourself a favor. It's incredible. Number 10, Fallen Leaves. Fallen Leaves is a charming, delicate, working class romance with just like such real characters and all they're trying to do is just trying to be happy. This made my heart very happy and very sad at the same time. Number nine, Barbie. Barbie is such an achievement. It's a movie that never should have worked with incredible art direction, comedy that actually lands. It had every reason to suck, yet Watching it in a buzzing crowd full of people wearing pink is probably a top 10 movie going experience for me. Number eight, No Hard Feelings. This is the kind of movie that makes you say, oh yeah, this is how rom-com should work. And then you will watch some low rent Netflix one and see how easy it is to mess up and how hard it is to make a good one. This is a shockingly good Back to Basics rom-com with genuine heart that has both one of my favorite comedic as well as my favorite dramatic scenes of the year. Number seven, you knew it was coming, Wonka. Everything but the movie itself is fighting for Wonka to fail. But despite this, Paul King pulls off another stunning achievement in making truly artful children's movies. This movie is just as good as Paddington 2. Number six, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is an anti-sensational crime drama that's more about like creating a sense of place than it is creating drama. And the epilogue is one of the most powerful strokes of kind of story craft I've ever seen from this directorial giant. Let's do the top five. Number five, Past Lives. What you assume is going to be a movie about choice instead turns out to be a movie about confronting a different version of yourself who you aren't anymore and you don't want to be anymore, but you could have been. Mourning this loss of an alternate life, it's, it's a complex feeling and this movie tackles it so well. It's a feeling that I think we've all had, but like many good stories, past lives makes its complex observations feel obvious. By the end, just the emotions come washing over at least me like a wave. When Nora releases, I release. I heard an interview with the director where she said that she was trying to make kind of a romance movie where everybody acts like adults because the impetus for a lot of romance movies is adults acting like kids. Um, but the truth is that we do act like children a lot in our adult lives. So because everyone is acting with an insane maturity in this, it feels a little bit like a fable. And that adds this kind of dreamy quality to the whole thing that makes the kind of emotional haymaker of what it's playing with even that much more effective. Number four, Saltburn. This is a gleefully nasty, gothic, erotic thriller that really knows its gothic roots and plays with that convention in a really fun way. It pulls the audience's strings in such a fun way. There were so many like, oh no, and <gasps> in the audience while I was watching it. The director knows exactly what they're doing and is taking an audience on for just an incredible ride. It's a movie about desire, obsession, power, and, and like bodily fluids. It's just really good fun. It's just so well observed and textured. It has such a great sense of humor. You can just tell that this was fun to make and that translates to the audience experience. In 2023, this is in the same league as like a Mission Impossible or a Megan for me as far as watching a movie and just like feeling like a kid. 
giggling like a delinquent <laughs> in my uh, theater seat. Number three, our body. Our body is a series of vignettes of people in a hospital where we see glimpses, but no resolution for any of them. And that sounds like that would be frustrating as a viewer, but the result is an incredible sense of oneness. The entire documentary feels impossibly like intimate. Throughout the three hour runtime, I was constantly like, well, we got to finish on this scene. This scene is the most like, how did you get this shot? And it would continue to do that over and over and over again. Each vignette made me feel so intensely human. Is the only way, I know it's a boring description, but that's the only way I can really describe how it felt. We travel through every stage of life in this hospital ward. And you feel this incredible sense of, of solidarity. At several points as the documentary goes on, we even hear the director from behind the camera optimistically encouraging some of the people she's doing talking heads with, which is so many documentarians are interested in uh, disappearing as much as possible. So to, to, to hear them talk and not only talk, but but to, to, to treat their subjects with humanness uh, is further solidified the whole vibe of the whole thing. I can confidently say that this is one of my favorite documentaries just of all time. Number two, Poor Things. Poor Things is hands down the best world buildy high concept sci-fi that we have had in years. Incredible art design, incredible performances. I love the execution of pretty much everything in this movie. The script feels so well observed and honest. And the costuming is so specific and beautiful. I'm not going to spoil anything, but... From a few of the opening scenes with Bella, you know you are in good hands. It establishes exactly the tone of the movie in a really beautiful way. The cast is just firing on all cylinders. The fact that Barbie came out this same year and it's not the movie with the best high concept production design. This movie tops it. That That's insane. If you like sci-fi at all, you owe it to yourself to see this movie. And in a year of great movies, my number one, In Water. This is a huge heart pick for me. In Water, shot mostly out of focus, is the most visceral visualization of memory that I've ever seen in a movie. On a plot level, it's just about some friends making a movie and their time off work. And for me, magically, it takes place in both the past and the present simultaneously. In a movie that only has a few scenes that are in focus, you want to assign some sort of meaning to the in focus or out of focus. Why are they weighted differently? But the incredible choice is that they don't mean anything different. They don't have inherently more or less weight than anything else. In your memories, you don't get to choose what stays crisp and what becomes blurry. There's a distinct sense of like melancholy or like FOMO or missing out or like singular vision that happens sometimes, like like with past lives when you're, you're reflecting on the past and it kind of reminds you to be present. I have never seen a movie tackle the subject in this kind of like theme or thought or idea in a way that In Water has. Ted Chang once called ChatGPT a blurry JPEG of the internet, and I feel that Hong Sang Su in In Water does that with our memory. I teared up multiple times during this movie, sometimes of just blurry shots of the ocean. I'm a Hong Sang Su head, so, you know, I was destined to be high on my list, but this is my favorite Hong Sang Su, and maybe one of my favorite movies. This movie is definitely not for everybody, but it really hit me hard. And so that's why I'm calling it my favorite movie of 2023. I struggle between this and Poor Things because I do think that Poor Things is objectively a better movie. But this one just means something to me. What were your favorite movies of 2023? I hope everyone has a beautiful New Year's. If you liked what you saw here, you can subscribe to Media Mood Board on Letterboxd or here on YouTube. I'll actually have a full list of all the movies that I've seen in 2023 ranked pinned on my Letterboxd profile. So I'll see you guys all next year 
uh, with more hyper-specific entertainment lists. My name is Houston. This is Media Mood Board. Bye. (laughs) 